Dartmoor Prison, isolated from the outside world by walls of granite. They say you could get out of here by merely telling what you know. You may or may not be another Scotland Yard bloke. But I'll give you the same answer I gave the others. I still have two years, eight months, and six days left in which to make musical boxes. That'll be sold at auction for the benefit of this delightful sanctuary. And I intend to serve them. Move along. And now we come to the next object on our list, or I should say objects, because there are three of them. Now, ladies and gentlemen, these can be bought together or separately. Now, these beautiful little musical boxes only arrived this morning, and I didn't intend to put them on the auction block until later, but I'm going to sell them now. So, good friends, as our old pal Mark Anthony used to say, lend me your ears. And what do you hear? Right. The beautiful tinkle tinkle of a musical box. What a lovely trinket. What a beautiful gift. Created and made by loving hands. A thing of beauty and utility. I was going to start with five pounds. It's a bargain, five pounds. Do I see any hands? If there's a connoisseur in the house of gold, three pounds for it. Two pounds. One pound. Ten shillings. Ten. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen. Ten shillings is offered for a musical box you couldn't buy anywhere in London for less than five pounds. It was stealing to let it go for ten shillings, like taking milk from a baby. All right, we still have ten shillings. Ten shillings, ten shillings is offered, ten shillings is offered, ten shillings is offered. And anybody give me one pound? Bring me one pound? I want someone to give me a pound. A uh, pound, one pound is offered, one pound is offered, ladies and gentlemen, one pound is offered, it's against you, sir. Will you go to two pounds? Will you go to two pounds, sir? Two pounds, two pounds is offered, two pounds is offered, one once, twice, third and the last call. Sold to the gentleman for two pounds. Sorry, my dear. Now, ladies and gentlemen, comes the opportunity to purchase an exact duplicate of the beautiful little musical box just bought by this gentleman for the ridiculous low price of two pounds. Oh, it's exactly the same. Exactly the same. Made with the same hands. You hear that? Isn't that lovely? That tinkle, 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 tinkle. <laughs> Sounds like Bow Bells to me, you know, little angels pulling on the ropes, eh? <laughs> Who'll give me two pounds for it? Who's starting with two pounds? Will anybody start with two pounds? Oh, come, come, ladies and gentlemen. You know, from your enthusiasm, we might all be in Scotland instead of London. Please buy it for me, Daddy. Two pounds, certainly not. We all might be in Scotland. Besides, I don't like his manner. One pound, ten shillings. One pound. One pound is ours. One pound, one pound is offered. One pound is offered, going one pound. In advance, going once, going twice. The third and the last call. Sold to the lady for one pound. <laughs> Smart bidding, my dear. Thank you. We come to the third and last of these beautiful little musical boxes. Exactly the same. Tinkle, tinkle. Isn't that lovely? Ladies and gentlemen, I don't bring you here to gully and a swindle you. This is the exact replica of those two I just sold before. We're closed. But this is extremely important. Come in, sir, come in. I'm sorry to disturb you, but I was unfortunately delayed from arriving in time to bid on certain articles which I was rather anxious to obtain. Or perhaps they weren't sold, sir. We are carrying several things over. Uh, what might the articles be, sir? Uh, three identical musical boxes, about uh, so large. Oh, I'm sorry, sir, but they were sold. Pity you weren't here to bid on them. Uh, they didn't bring anything like the real value. I'm most anxious to obtain them. I wonder if your records would show who the purchasers were. Oh, we don't usually give out that information, sir. <laughs> For certain, shall we say, uh, sentimental reasons, I'm most anxious to get in touch with the purchasers. I'd be willing to pay, shall we say, uh, five pounds. Well, for certain sentimental reasons, sir, we'd be very happy to oblige. Alfred, mm. today's sales. The three musical boxes. Musical boxes, oh. Ah, here we are. The first purchase for two pounds from Mr. Julian Emery, 52 Portman Square. Write this address down, Alfred. Yes, sir. Second didn't leave any name. Oh, how unfortunate. Mm, I think she's a dealer. You see, they don't like us to know where the things are going. On account of the profits. 
You say the uh, second purchaser was a woman. Can you uh, give me a description of her? Oh, she was a young woman, fairly tall, slender, uh, she had a light complexion and dark hair, and, and she was wearing a... Uh, a grey suit, don't you remember? That's right. Uh, she probably runs a gift shop. Uh, she paid uh, one pound. You say she uh, comes here fairly frequently? No, I didn't say so. But she does, sir. Like as not, she'll come in on Thursday. We have sales on Mondays and Thursdays. Oh. And the uh, third box? The third? Oh, uh, Mr. William Kilgore, 143B Hampton Way. For ten shillings. Hmm. Quite a drop from two pounds. Mr. Kilgore was a Scotchman. Oh. Uh, thank you. You've, uh, you must help Oh, <laughs> thank you, sir. And any time you're passing, dropping, we always have lovely things for sale. How oh, can't you? Uh, thank you. I'll uh, be back Thursday. message reached us too late. Musical boxes are being sold. Well, let's get out of here. Someday you'll go too far. <laughs> Reaching for a star, you fool. Yet a fool may touch a star, Colonel Kavanaugh, if he but reach high enough, but not possess it as you would. The musical boxes, they've been sold. What a pity for you, my dear Colonel. Is it my fault that the message reached us only an hour ago? Is it my fault that they were sold? She can't hold me responsible for that. I hope for your sake you're right. upon you tonight at a quarter to eight, a gentleman who desires to consult you upon a matter of the very deepest moment. Now, remember that letter, Holmes? It was written over two years ago. An interesting case. Devilishly interesting. Hmm. Irene Adler. What a striking looking woman from the brief glance I had of her. Seems only yesterday. What charm. Hmm. What poise and what a mind. Sharp enough and brilliant enough to outwit the, the great Sherlock Holmes himself. I take it the new issue of the Strand magazine is out, containing another of your slightly lurid tales. Indeed. And what do you call this one? I call it A Scandal in Bohemia. Not a bad title, eh? Hmm. If you must record my exploits, I do wish you'd put less emphasis on the melodramatic and more on the intellectual issues involved. More on the intellectual? What do you mean by that? Well, I do hope you've given uh, the woman a soul. She had one, you know. By the woman? I suppose you mean Irene Adler. Yes. I shall always remember her as the woman. Come in. I think. That's it, old boy. How are you? How are you, old boy? I haven't seen you for years. <laughs> I want you to meet my old friend Sherlock Holmes. Holmes, this is Stinky. In other words, uh, uh, Julian Emery. How do you do, Mr. Emery? Watson has often spoken of you. Oh, had he? <laughs> yes, we were at school together. Yes, more years ago than I care to remember, but you didn't come in here just to remind me of that. No, I just happened to be in the neighborhood and saw your lights burning, so I took the liberty of looking you up. Still writing your mystery stuff? Yes, well, there's a new one out this week. <laughs> good, I never miss them. Oh, good, <laughs> thanks. I say that bandage makes you look very interesting. Still poking your nose into other people's business as usual? <laughs> Who hit you? I haven't the foggiest notion. Somebody knocked me on the head in my own living room, and then proceeded to commit the most idiotic burglary you ever heard of. <laughs> Fellow must have been barmy as a coot. Barmy? Why? <laughs> Come sit down, old boy. Hey. Would you, you like a cup of tea? Huh? Oh, all right. I'll go and tell Mrs. Hudson about it. Why did you say the robbery was idiotic, Mr. Emery? Oh, simply from the fact that uh, with about five thousand pounds worth of musical boxes in my living room, the thief who I caught in the act made off with one that isn't even worth five pounds. I gather you're a collector of musical boxes. Yes, I am indeed. Some of them are very beautiful, but not the one that was stolen. 
The thief uh, evidently grabbed the first thing that came to his hand when he heard me coming into the room. Still, it's rather odd, isn't it, that having disposed of you, he didn't pick up something more valuable. Mm -hmm. Was there anything unusual about the stolen box? No, nothing at all. No, I, I picked it up in the south of France, oh, several years ago. You say you have many valuable music boxes. And yet the thief made off with one that isn't worth five pounds. Sounds like rather an intriguing little problem. As <laughs> well, I take it that he was just an ordinary petty thief and didn't know the value. That is a possible explanation, and yet I venture to say that the average petty thief has a more extensive knowledge of the value of object da than the average collector. <laughs> well, anyway, that's gotten the odds theory. They didn't get very excited about it. That's consistent, anyway. I wonder if I might see your collection, Mr. Emery. Oh, of course you could, yes. Uh, nothing a collector likes more than showing off his trophies. Uh, when will it suit you? No time like the present. Good! My place is just round in Portman Square. Shall we? Yes, right. Hello? Where are you going? Stinky hasn't had his tea yet. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> We're going round to my place. But I'm going to give you something better than tea. <laughs> Now, this one was made for Louis XV, and is one of the very few still in existence from that period, and a particularly fine specimen of that. <laughs> Charming, isn't it? Quite. They all sound to me like a lot of mice running about on a tin roof. I'm afraid you have no ear for music, Watson. Mm. Give me a good old band playing a rousing march. You have all your silly little tweet tweets. <laughs> Stupid thing, singing rabbit. <laughs> what would you say offhand is the value of a box like that, Mr. Emery? Well, right? it's hard to say offhand, but I think we'll bring about five or six hundred pounds a day. It's the gem of my collection. A thief who steals an oddity like a musical box passes up one worth five hundred pounds for one of almost no value at all. Odd. Very odd. What is a stolen box like, Mr. Emery? Oh, just a plain wooden box, about um, so big. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I have one over here, almost exactly like it. I picked this up yesterday at an auction room in Knightsbridge. <laughs> Paid only two pounds for it. Of course, I wouldn't in the ordinary way add one like this to my collection, but the, um, the tune intrigued me. I'd never heard it before. You have a remarkable ear for music, Holmes. Rather an unusual melody. Sit down, Bill. Thanks. You, uh, you see, you bought that box at an auction sale yesterday. Yes, the Gaylord auction rooms in uh, Knightsbridge. Mm -hmm. Run by old, uh, what's his name? Crabtree. That's the man. At what time is the robbery committed? Oh, about uh, three o'clock this morning. You know, Mr. Emery, that box and the robbery might well be cause and effect, mm -hmm. especially since you say that the stolen box outwardly resembles this one a great deal. And uh, Scotland Yard were not particularly interested, eh? Oh, yes, but I, I wouldn't blame him for that. Especially as I told him I was quite unable to describe the thief. Except, of course, for the fact that uh, it was definitely a man. All you remember is that you came in here and someone struck you on the head. Yes, the next thing I knew, my man was trying to revive me. Mm, it might be wise for you to put that box away somewhere and lock it up. Oh, I don't think that's necessary. Besides, everything's insured. Well, at least if any further attempts at robbery are made, I'd suggest that you call the police rather than running into any personal danger. Oh, come, Holmes, aren't you being a bit of an alarmist? Possibly. Oh, Mr. Gray, with old Stinky, seems to me you are making rather a mountain out of a mosque. Mole Hill is the word, old boy, and it's time you were in bed. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for letting us see your place. Now the bed's been bad meeting you. Holmes, I can't understand why you were so mysterious. Seems to me the petty thief explanation was the only sensible one. Really? Yes, I can't see how you can believe it was anything else. I didn't say I believed it to be anything else. The petty thief theory is the obvious one, I grant you. However, it's often a mistake to accept something as true merely because it's obvious. The truth is only arrived at by the painstaking process of eliminating the untrue. We are not able to do that in this case without further data. Oh, rubbish, you're pulling my leg. <laughs> you're trying to turn a... A tuppenny halfpenny robbery into an international plot. No, I'm not. I just hope that your friend Stinky is a little more cautious in the future. Just in case.
Hello? Yeah? Julian Emery here. Who? Right. <laughs> of course I remember you, Mrs. Courtney. Yes. Yes, you're the one bright spot at that the dull affair of Lady Sanford's. <laughs> huh? Of course it isn't too late to come around. Yes, I shall be delighted to give you a drink. I tell you what, come straight up and I'll leave the door unlet. Right, that's well, fifteen minutes? Good. <laughs> I shall be counting each moment. <laughs> no, no, I mean that, really. <laughs> right, goodbye. <laughs> Oh, you startled me. <laughs> Did I? <laughs> yes. Must be the pixie in me. <laughs> I know I shouldn't have called you so late. But I was at a party just around the corner, and I remembered your invitation to see your collection of musical boxes. My dear Mrs. Courtney, pleasure is all the greater for being so unexpected. <laughs> My friends call me Hilda. <laughs> Thanks. Mine call me Stinky. Stinky, how quaint. Oh, what a perfectly wonderful collection of musical boxes. You know, when you told me you had a collection, I had no idea it was so attractive. <laughs> yes. They appeal to the ear as well as to the uh, eye. Oh, what a plain little one. Why, it looks just like a country cousin amid all this grandeur. No, 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 no. You mustn't underestimate the country cousin. I only last night a burger broke in here, and with all these to choose from, went off with one very much like it. Really? Yes, I don't mind the loss of the box so much, but I do resent this crack on the skull. But it makes you look so interesting. Oh, <laughs> do you think so? Uh -huh. <laughs> it's funny that's what old Fatso said. Fatso? I mean, uh, Dr. Watson. He was here this evening with a friend, a Mr. Holmes. He's interested in my collection, too. Sherlock Holmes? Yes. Do you know him? I've heard of him. <laughs> yes, he, he seems to think I'm in some sort of uh, danger. What a haunting tune. It takes me right back to my childhood. <laughs> really? <laughs> you know, it's odd that you should be interested in that particular musical box. Odd? Why? Because Mr. Holmes is also interested in it. <laughs> he may have been more interested in the tune than in the box. I hear you, yes, that's right. I remember now, he whistled it note for note, having heard it only once. Really? He must be a remarkable man. <laughs> Bit of an alarmist, to be asked me. <laughs> Don't you believe in warnings? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> Who would want a box like that? I would. You're not serious. Oh, but I am. Well, you, you put me in a very awkward position. I'm a collector, you know. And the collector buys but never sells. But if the price were high enough... <laughs> the price has nothing to do with it. It's the principle of the thing. <laughs> yes, well, we haven't had our drink. No, thanks. I must be getting along. Must you, really? I'm afraid so. You're not walking out on me, are you? My reputation, stinky. <laughs> I say, you know, you are an attractive woman. Thanks. You fool. I told you to wait outside. What did you have to kill him for? All I had to do was walk out with this. He held you in his arms. Don't touch him. Don't touch anything. Now get out. I'm sorry. You're sorry. What about me? This is murder. What about Scotland Yard? What about Sherlock Holmes? Now get out! Get it? Good. Did you have any uh, trouble with him? Just a matter of murder. Ah, Mr. Holmes. Hopkins. Thanks for coming so promptly. Inspector Lestrade suggested that I call through to you. Well, Mr. Emery was the client of Mr. Holmes, Inspector. Indeed. You didn't mention that when I telephoned you, Mr. Holmes? Well, not exactly a client, Inspector. Dodgen Thompson? He was killed between the hours of 11 and 2 o'clock this morning, Mr. Holmes. Must have been someone he knew, someone of whom he had no suspicion. Poor old Stinky. It's all my fault. I should have prevented this. Well, there's no time to start talking about that now, Doctor. Apparently it's gone. 
That's the second attempt on the musical box that Emery bought at the auction sale. And this time it was successful. But that box is only worth two pounds. It was worth a man's life, Watson. I think we'd better pay a visit to Gaylord's auction room and that fellow Crabtree. Inspector, may I suggest that you make a complete search of this flat for a small, plain, musical box about that size? Thank you. Come on, Watson. You say the first box went to Mr. Julian Emery, the second to Mr. Kilgore, 143 B Hampton Way, and the third to the unidentified young lady who presumably has a shop and lives near Golders Green. That's right, Mr. Holmes. Isn't it rather strange, Mr. Crabtree? You should have had three identical musical boxes, all playing the same tune. Where'd they come from? Dartmoor Prison. Dartmoor? Yeah, we get a regular shipment from there every month. The inmates manufactured them. Well, they make all kinds of things, you know, pipe racks, waste paper baskets, musical boxes. Did you happen to notice if anyone showed any particular interest during the auction in the purchasers of these three boxes? Oh, come on, Mr. Crabtree. This is very literally a matter of life and death. Well, since you put it that way, Mr. Holmes, there was a gentleman came in here about an hour after closing time, and he was in a, an awful state, he was. He gave me five pounds to tell him where the boxes had gone to. He said they had a sentimental value for him, sir. Oh, expensive sentiment. Can you describe him? Well, he was tall, distinguished looking, and he had gray hair and a moustache. Oh, he was quite a gentleman, sir. Now, what was his reaction when you were unable to supply him with the address of the young lady who owned the shop? I told him the young lady usually come back on Thursday. He said he'd come back on Thursday. Now, that's tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Cadbury. You've been very helpful. Thank you. Come on, Watson. Where are we going now, Holmes? The home of Mr. Kilgore, the man aboard the third box. But hang it all, Holmes. How do you know those other two musical boxes are of any importance? I don't, but I certainly have no intention of waiting until the owners are murdered to find out. No one at home. I hope that's the explanation. I'll have a look through this window. Doesn't seem to be anyone there. The well, place seems deserted, as far as I can see. Yes. Mr. and Mrs. Kilgore at home? No. When do you expect them? Oh, in an hour or so. So there's no use your hanging about. They don't buy nothing from peddlers. Peddlers? My good woman, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Uh, Sherlock Holmes? Oh, go on. Do you mind if we come in and wait? <clears throat> my business is rather urgent. Well, I've got to go out and do my shopping. And I don't know as Mrs. Kilgore would like any strangers nosing about. It's quite all right, I assure you. Well, I've got to be off. It's too white in the parlor. And no smoking, either. Mrs. Kilgore says it smells up the house. Funny old girl, um. Hmm. Park Lane. Park Lane? And what would the likes of you be doing in Park Lane? Now, don't worry about the fair duck. If you know how to get the Park Lane up it. You know, Holmes, I've been thinking. There must have been something hidden in that box of old stinkers. Stolen jewelry, possibly. What's up, Holmes? Listen. What's just some steam in the water pipes? Yeah, yeah. All right, my dear. There, there, there. Now, don't worry. It's all over. There hmm. you are, dear. Don't cry anymore. She tied me up and shut me in the cupboard. I know, I know. She won't come back. Did you show her your new musical box? Yes, she said she wanted to hear it play. And as soon as I showed it to her, she grabbed all no, of I know, I know. Now, don't worry, nobody. We'll buy you a new musical box. Yes, my dear, the best one in London. Watson. Oh, what a fool, what a fool I've been. What do you mean, Holmes? She took the musical box out of this house and that market basket. Right under our very noses. Why could the Kilgore charwoman want to take the music box? She isn't the Kilgore charwoman. She's a consummate actress. An extremely clever, unscrupulous woman who will stop at nothing. Take care of the child, will you, Wolf, her till, till her parents get back. Explain everything to them. Of course, I will. But, Holmes, where are you going? Somewhere, somehow. I must get to the young lady who bought that third musical box before our opponents find out. I only hope that I won't be too late. Oh, no. No, no. No, no, no. Don't. 
darling, you, you mustn't cry anymore. Now, cheer up. Would you, would you like to hear old uncle make a noise like a duck? Now, ladies and gentlemen, how much am I offered for this beautiful lace Dresden china figurine? A lady of the French court. Now, this is the genuine article. What a beautiful ornament for your mantelpiece. Or you could use it as a centerpiece on the dining room table. Now, will somebody start me for ten pounds? Will somebody start me for ten pounds? Eight pounds. Seven pounds. All right, five. Five pounds is offered, five pounds is offered, five pounds is offered. Five pounds, ten. Five pounds, fifteen. Five pounds, fifteen. Six pounds is offered, six pounds, six pounds, going once, going twice, the third and the last call will be all done. Sold to the lady from Twickenham for six pounds. Next, we have a real museum piece, ladies and gentlemen. A fine 19th century doll. The costume and exact replica of the holiday clothes worn by the Hungarian peasant women. Now, ladies and gentlemen, an article like this will cost you from 15 to 20 pounds in a West End shop. I'm not going to ask for anything like that. Who'll give me two pounds for it? Two pounds. Does anybody offer me two pounds? Two pounds for the hunk? The area? Two pounds? One pound. What? Does anybody give me one pound? Anybody offer me one pound for the doll? One, one pound is offered, ladies and gentlemen. One pound is offered. Now, I'm not going to waste your valuable time or mine in trying to get one half of what this beautiful doll is worth. If the young lady can steal it for one pound, that's her good fortune. So it's going once, it's going twice, the third and last ball. Any more? Sold to the young lady for one pound. And now, ladies and gentlemen, may I draw your attention to something which may be a great surprise to you, worthy of any collection. The only other one like it is in the British Museum. It's a Ming vase of the Seventh Dynasty. This vase lay in a large collection somewhere outside Rome for over two centuries, I understand. It was discovered there by the noted antiquarian Sir Andrew Copleston. Now, some of you may remember Sir Andrew Copleston. Besides being a noted traveler and antiquarian, he's also a gentleman rider. A girl with a parcel in her hands, that's her. Are you sure that's the girl? Well, she fits perfectly the auctioneer's description. Follow her, Hamid. Lovely, dear. And only one pound. You can get at least three for it. Easily. I'll go make some tea. I could do with a cup. Right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm looking for a birthday gift for a seven-year-old girl. What would you suggest? We have some lovely dolls. Now, this Hungarian I peasant... think she has enough dolls already. Books are always welcome. Well, I'm looking for something a little different. Oh, that's rather cute. Uh, what is it? Oh, that's a musical box. Children always love them. And this is an exceptionally nice one. It plays many tunes. Have you any others? Yes. If you'll just step this way. I have only two left. How oh, nice. Are you sure this is all you have? I'm sorry. They're rather hard to find, you know. That's our entire allotment. I did have one other, but I sold it earlier this afternoon. But it was only a plain wooden one. It wouldn't have been a very nice gift for a child. Really? Do you happen to know who the purchaser was? Why, yes. He left his card, just in case anyone should inquire for him. How interesting. I'm sorry, but I'm afraid I'll have to look a bit further. Thank you, anyway. 
Good afternoon. Thank you. Scotland Yard. Hop in. Sherlock Holmes, I might have known. We thought we were the hunters, instead of which we're the hunted. We've been fools. We played right into his hands. Of course. He's had us followed. Don't look. The man in front of the toy shop. I mean, turn sharp right at the next corner and again at the next. No photograph of her, Commissioner, as I expected. She's not an uncriminal. But how do you expect to know if you do find her? After all, she was disguised as, as a charwoman. Don't worry, old fellow. If I ever see her again, I'll recognize her. Well, it won't be long till we know who they are and from where they operate. Who's covering them? Uh, Sergeant Thompson's following them, sir. They won't get away from him. He's a good man. We could have arrested them at Clifford's toy shop if we had any proof. But we know that they killed Emera. Proof, my dear fellow. We must have proof. We have x-rayed it, sir. There's nothing whatever concealed in the box. We'll have a look at the plates. Hmm. There must be some clue. And it's probably so obvious that we've all overlooked it. Seems to me we're up against a bunch of lunatics. Not lunatics, my dear fellow. Extremely astute, cold-blooded murderers. Well, what can these little musical boxes have in them that's so important? Don't forget, they were made in Dartmoor prison. You can smuggle stuff into prison, but not out. Do you want us to break the box apart, sir, to see if there's anything the X-ray hasn't caught? No, not yet. Do you mind if I take it? Certainly. Thanks. The governor of Dartmoor Prison informed us, sir, in answer to Mr. Holmes' uh, question, that all three musical boxes were made by the same convict, John Davidson. Seven to seven year term, sir. Davidson? The Bank of England plates. That'll be all. Yes, sir. Now we're getting somewhere. If... Wait a minute. How did you know about the plates, Mr. Holmes? I'm a student of crime, Inspector. I make it my business to know about such things. And when the name of Davidson was mentioned... Well, who is this fellow Davidson? As long as Mr. Holmes seems to know all about it already, I suppose there's no harm in telling you. Uh, two years ago in London, there occurred a robbery of such tremendous importance, uh, although the stolen articles themselves have no intrinsic value whatsoever, that the Home Secretary was instrumental in seeing that not a word of it appeared in any newspaper. But you never told me anything about this, Holmes? You were away at the time. Articles of no intrinsic value and yet of such importance? <laughs> I don't understand. Davidson was apprehended within 15 minutes of committing the theft. But by that time, he'd hidden the articles in question and they've yet to be found. Before going further, Dr. Watson, I must inform you that this matter's not to be mentioned outside of this room. Of course not. Do I look like a man who'd gossip? Let's not go into that now, old fellow, shall we? Davidson had been employed for years in a position of extreme trust by the engravings department of the Bank of England. The articles he stole were nothing less than a complete duplicate set of plates for printing five-pound notes. What? The Bank of England's own plates? Precisely. And with those plates, a gang of crooks could flood England with five-pound notes, not forged in the usual sense of the word, but notes undetectable from genuine Bank of England notes in any way whatsoever. Good heavens. Any whisper at all might have resulted in enormous damage in shaking public confidence in the Treasury. We tried everything after we arrested Davidson. Offered him a shorter sentence if he'd tell us where he'd hidden the plates. Why, we even put in Scotland Yard men with him as cellmates, but no results. Obviously, Davidson is a man of strong character and infinite patience. Yet suddenly he feels impelled to smuggle out the secret of the hiding place of the plates to his confederates. Why? I don't understand, Mr. Holmes. Well, for example, has the Bank of England made any plans to radically change the design of the five-pound note so that in, say, uh, seven years from now, notes made from the stolen plates will be worthless? 
Confidentially, Mr. Holmes, such a move was discussed. But replacing all the five pound notes in circulation would be such a Herculean task that nothing's been done about it as yet. I see. Of course, there is another possible explanation. Davidson didn't have much time to find a hiding place before he was captured. He may be afraid that the plates will be accidentally discovered before he's released. Hence his anxiety to communicate their whereabouts to his confederates as soon as possible. I believe you've hit it, Mr. Holmes. I'm sure that the message is contained in this musical box. Or rather, in all three musical boxes, since possession of all three seems to be essential. Our opponents have two-thirds of the puzzle, we have one-third. Well, what are you going to do, Holmes? Try to deduce the message from the one-third that we have. the same tune as the one played by Emery's musical box. And yet it's different. Sounds the same to me. The tune. Somehow the tune is the key to the mystery. It must be the tune. Otherwise, why use three musical boxes to convey the message? Why not collar boxes or shoe boxes? Yes? It's for you, Inspector. Oh, thank you, sir. Inspector Hopkins speaking. What? Where? Golders Green Station reports they've just found Sergeant Thompson's body. From the tire marks on his clothes, he was apparently run over by taxi. What an unfortunate accident. Not an accident, my dear fellow. I'm afraid it's murder. Just who you're going to meet When you're walking down a busy London street Mrs. Hawkins, Mrs. Brown, any subject of the crowd Oh, you never know just who you're going to meet So you better hold your topper in your hand Just in case you meet a lady on the strand Girls will think you're kind of sweet, and your day will be complete. Oh, you never know just who you're going to meet. Now a gentleman is judged by his appearance. Yes, a gentleman is judged by how he talks. Now he's much better off when he's acting like a top, especially if he's taking him a walk. What on earth is this outlandish place? A rendezvous for actors. Actors? <clears throat> Buskers, old boy. You've seen them a thousand times. Actors who entertain the queues, waiting outside theatres. Mr. Holmes. How are you, Joe? Never met him. And yourself? Fine, thank you. I want you to meet a friend of mine, Dr. Watson, Joe's sister. Oh, well, any friend of Mr. Holmes is a friend of mine. Hi, hey, Joe. He did me a good turn once that I'll never forget. Yes, I cleared Joe of a most unpleasant charge. Murder, no less. Oh, really? By proving to the satisfaction of the police that he was busy at the time, blowing open someone's safe. That's right, Governor. Good gracious me. Uh, Joe, uh, now you can help me. Come on, buzz off, buzz off. Come on, up it, up it. Can't a gentleman have some peace and quiet around here? And you too. There you are, Mr. Holmes. Now we can have some peace and quiet around here. Thank you, Joe. There's five pounds of this for you. 
Well, I wouldn't want to take it on myself, sir. But I can get somebody to do it for you for half of that. You don't know what the job is yet. For five pounds? Murder, ain't it? What? No, you're not murder, just uh, music. I want you to identify a song for me. Oh, there ain't a song that's been written that I don't know. That's why I came to you. Now, of course, the violin is more my instrument, but... Um, oh, well, here we go. Now, listen to this, Joe. Wait a minute. You're playing that wrong. That should be E natural, not E flat. You know the song? Oh, yes. It's an old Australian song called uh, The Swagman. But you're playing it all wrong. That's what I hoped you'd say. Now, listen again, Joe. That's the same tune, all right. But you're making different mistakes than you did the first time. No, not mistakes, Joe. Call them variations. Here, play the song for me. But you know the way it's written. What's it mean, Holmes? Are you on to something? Perhaps. I don't know yet. It's probably a code of some sort. Joe? Could you write the song down for me? The way it was originally written? Oh, sure, Miss Downs. But it'll take a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Here, Mabel. Hey, Lale. Come on, up to it. Along with it. Obviously, it isn't the lyrics. No combination of those words made any sense at all. The variations in the way Emery's musical box played the tune are different from the variations in the one we have. You sure? Quite. You see, I took the trouble to memorize the tune as played by Emery's box that night we were with him in his flat. Holmes, you amaze me. Elementary, my dear fellow, one of the first principles in solving crime is never to disregard anything, no matter how trivial. But why the three boxes? Why not one? Because the message was obviously too long to be conveyed by any one variation. Then there's the third box, the one that woman took from the Kilgores. That contains yet another set of variations. Yes, so it's all beyond me. Well, all we have to do now is to find the secret of the variations. Not a very easy problem to solve, my dear fellow. Hello. What's up? We've had company. I say, this is outrageous. Ask Mrs. Hudson to come in here, will you? Right. Mrs. Hudson? Yes? Oh, there you are. Will you come up here at once, please? Oh, coming, sir. In me, Mr. Holmes. What has happened? Who called while we were out, Mrs. Hudson? Just a young lady. The one who said you wanted her to wait for you. And a nice looking old gentleman with Our her. friends again, Watson. Friends? What did the young lady look like? Oh, I, I couldn't see her face. She had a, a heavy black veil on. But she had such a nice way with her. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Holmes, if I've done anything wrong. But you did say I should always let clients come in and wait for you. Don't worry, Mrs. Hudson, don't worry. You had no way of knowing. It's quite all right, quite all right. Now, don't worry, Mrs. Hudson. Don't worry. Where on earth's the musical box? They didn't get it. Didn't get it? Where is it? It's in your hand. Huh? That biscuit jar. Take the biscuits off the top. Now, put your hand inside, and you'll find the music box. Well done, Holmes. Well done. Amazing. <laughs> oh, 
Whew. Nice fresh smell. Like the pub after closing time. <laughs> I say, Holmes. What? It's morning. Allow me to congratulate you on a brilliant bit of deduction. <laughs> it's not a transposition, not a polygraph transposition, not a trigraph, nor any known form of decoding. How about the Morse code? Have you tried that? Yes, at about three o'clock this morning. I'm sorry, old man. I was only trying to help. Oh, do me a favor. Not again. Must have heard that thing a thousand times. Keep me awake all night. A very distinguished conversation, I grant you. You know perfectly well I don't know one tune from the other. When I was a kid, my people tried to have me taught the piano. I've always felt sorry for that old teacher of mine. The poor old girl finally reached the point of numbering the keys for me. One, two, three, four. Even then, I, I never progressed beyond... Numbering the keys, Watson? The 19th key of the keyboard is the 19th letter of the alphabet. S. Here. I'll be down when I give it to my fellow, will you? First altered note. Write S first. Now the eighth a key is H. The fifth key E. The twelfth key L. The sixth key F. S H E L F. Shelf. <laughs> Your piano lessons were not in vain, old fellow. You've solved it. Thank you. Uh, oh, thanks, old man. Hold it. We now have two-thirds of the message behind books. Third shelf secretary, Dr. S. Presumably, these are the first and second portions of the message. And this gang has the first and third parts of it. Precisely. Then it's a stalemate? Yes, Commissioner, but we can't leave it like that. There's no doubt in my mind that they will try to secure our third of the message that's missing. Well, I assume you've taken every precaution to guard the Clifford music. Oh, yes, it's carefully hidden at Baker Street with Dr. Watson on guard. However, I'm reasonably certain that, uh, difficult as it may be, we can find the plates even without the missing part of the message. Behind books, third shelf secretary, Dr. S. And outside of the fact that Davidson hid the Bank of England plates somewhere in London, Mr. Holmes, I don't see that we've progressed at all. Allow me to point out to you, sir, the key words, Dr. S. It looks as if the plates were hidden in the house of the doctor. Whether S stands for his first or last initial remains to be determined by a process of elimination. Well, there must be 10,000 doctors in London with S for a first or last initial. Precisely. And every one of them will have to be questioned in person. That's why I say this is a task for Scotland Yard. It's a task, all right. But Scotland Yard has searched worse haystacks and found a needle. Well, for the time being, I'll leave the matter in your hands, gentlemen. We'll call you if and when we get a lead on our mysterious Dr. S. Thank you. In the meantime, I intend to follow up a little clue concerning a cigarette. Mm. You're certain of the identification of the tobacco? Absolutely. I have made up this special blend for only three customers. It is almost pure Egyptian, mm -hmm. with admixture of Latakia for added body and a pinch of perique. Merely a whisper, as one might say, for elusive fragrance. Yes, yes, and the, um, the three customers? Major Wilson in Bombay, India. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Catherine Leamington Smith mm -hmm. in Ireland. Yes, and the third? Mrs. Hilda Courtney of Park Mansions, Bryanston Square. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've been most helpful. It is a pleasure to have been of service, Mr. Holmes. Yes. Mrs. Courtney? Yes. Uh, my name is Sherlock Holmes. Oh, do come in. Thank you. I've heard of you, of course, Mr. Holmes. I believe we have a mutual friend in Sir Edward Brookdale. He's spoken to me of you quite often. Indeed. And to what good fortune am I indebted for this visit? I think you know Mrs. Courtney. 
<laughs> well, I, I did get a summons for speeding last week. But outside of that, I don't think I'm of any interest to the police. Oh, come now, Mrs. Courtney. You seem to forget that you and I have met before. I'm sorry. I'm sure I would have remembered meeting the great Sherlock Holmes. Please sit down. Thank you. You say we met before. Yes. At the home of Mr. and Mrs. Kilgore, 143B Hampton Road. Kilgore? I don't think I know anyone of that name. Well, I didn't say you knew them. As a matter of fact, you called on them when they were out. I don't understand, Mr. Holmes. Really? And you were dressed rather differently. Indeed. Cigarette? Thank you. Thank you. You know, Mrs. Courtney, people generally forget in assuming a disguise that the shape of the ear is an almost infallible means of recognition and identification to the trained eye. Evidently, you've mistaken me for someone else. Oh, no, not at all. Though, naturally, I expected your denial. But when you paid your visit to my rooms at Baker Street, you carelessly left behind another identification. They're, uh, identical, aren't they? Yes, I must admit they are. You see, Mr. Holmes, to catch one as clever as you, I had to use a very special lure. I knew you'd be unable to resist the bait of my cigarette, having read with great interest your monograph on the ashes of 140 different varieties of tobacco. I should advise you not to move, Mr. Holmes. I must congratulate you on your ingenuity, Mrs. Courtney. It was indeed a brilliantly designed trap. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Praise from a master is indeed gratifying. I shall always cherish the memory of your flattering words. Memory? Precisely. I'm afraid these gentlemen have a most regrettable task to perform. Unless, of course, you care to turn over the missing musical box with your pledge to take no action against us in the future. I'm afraid that will be impossible. I thought that would be your answer. Hamid! Careful! Careful. There's no need to be unnecessarily rough with our distinguished guests. You realize, Mr. Holmes, that your demise will not take place here at the uh, Corpus Delecti, you know? Well, naturally. Shall we go? It's so fearfully awkward having a dead body lying about. Don't you agree, Mr. Holmes? Another dead body shouldn't weigh too heavily on your conscience, Mrs. Courtney. Mind if I have a cigarette? I uh, don't see why not. Be careful, Hamid. It's the brakes they bind. Thank you, Colonel Kavanagh. It's very considerate of you. to know, Mr. Holmes, that your death will be a painless one. Hamid, attach this to the motor of the taxi. That little attachment, my dear Mr. Holmes, contains the deadly fluid known as monosulfide. The Germans use it with gratifying results in removing their undesirables. Start the motor. his mouth. Now, 
Up with him, Hamid. You find yourself like Mohammed's coffin, Mr. Holmes, suspended between heaven and earth. Plenty of fuel in the tank? Good. It would be too bad to have anything go wrong through so simple an oversight. Good afternoon. Mr. Sherlock Holmes? No, I'm Dr. Watson. Oh, of course, Dr. Watson. How stupid of me. Oh, so, this is stupid of me. Uh, won't you come in? Well, I, I really came to see Mr. Holmes. Oh, I'm afraid he's out. I don't know when he'll be back. Perhaps there's something I can do. Well, won't you sit down? Thank you. You know, uh, Sherlock Holmes and I have been engaged on a, on a great many cases. Oh, really? Yes, indeed. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, this very moment, we're involved in, in one of the most baffling... Oh, well, uh, won't you tell me your trouble? I, I may be able to help you. That's very kind of you, Dr. Watson. Perhaps if I wouldn't be imposing too much. Imposing? Oh, there's no imposition. No imposition at all. A pleasure, I assure you. Now, tell me all about it, Miss... Uh, Miss Williams. Miss Williams. I live in Surrey, Dr. Watson, and, and I've come up to London in sheer desperation. My only sister has disappeared, and the local police seem utterly unable to find her. Well, Holmes and I solved a case exactly like that once. Very interesting, as far as I remember. Uh, I call it the, the adventure of the, the, the solitary cyclist. Oh, sorry. Uh, now I come to think of it, it wasn't so very similar. Uh, entirely different. I didn't think what I was saying. <laughs> uh, 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 where were we? She's only 17, Dr. Watson, and until she disappeared last Thursday, she seemed to be in the best of spirits. Or possibly a romantic entanglement? Oh, no, no, nothing of the sort. She left no note, didn't even pack a bag, no explanation. She just started to walk to the village from our house in broad daylight and simply vanished from the face of the earth. Oh, there, 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 there. Might I have a glass of water? Glass of, glass of, glass of water. Have one in one minute. Thank you, Dr. Watson. No, 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 you're not to cry anymore. You must pull yourself together. Oh, I feel much better already knowing that you're going to help me. Oh, Dr. Watson, look! Good heavens! <laughs> get through, get through the fire brigade, quickly! Haven't you a fire extinguisher? By joy, we have it. Miss Williams, we'll have this thing out in no time. Ah, <coughs> oh, that's got it. It's a mare. 
Well, you see, there was, there was no need for the fire brigade after all. <laughs> I hope you weren't too frightened, Miss Williams. <sighs> oh, gone. What a trouble with them. They always lose their heads in an emergency. <laughs> well? A musical box. Great Scott! Miss Williams! Well? Good. And Holmes? By now, Mr. Holmes has no doubt exchanged his violin for a harp. Always assuming that heaven is his destination. Yeah. And now that we have the missing musical box... Nineteenth note. Nineteenth letter. Yes. He hasn't been there, you say? Holmes, where on earth have you been? I've been trying to get you at the club, at Scotland Yard, all over London. You were looking for me in the wrong places. Holmes, uh, terrible things happened. I've been duped. That woman, she made a complete fool of me. Well, what do you mean? Well, she came here, let off a smoke bomb. I thought the whole place was on fire, and my first thought was to, to save a musical box. No need to say any more. She has box. Yes. Don't blame yourself too much, old fellow. She is an extremely clever antagonist. Smoke bomb, you said. <laughs> well, you can console yourself with the thought that your charming friend is at least a reader of yours. What do you mean? If I remember correctly, you wrote about my little experiment with smoke and the cry of fire in a story you entitled A Scandal in Bohemia, which has just appeared in the Strand magazine. All right, all right, old boy. Don't rub it in. <laughs> well, it may cheer you up to know that you made a fool of me, too. Ah, well, that cigarette stub was planted here for one express purpose. We're going to bandaging around this place. Bandaging? What's the matter, Holmes? You Ex hurt? An explanation, so I'll have to wait until later. At the moment, we're faced with a problem. I fear it is insurmountable. Come over here, will you? Right. Our opponents are in possession of all three parts of the code. And here are we, while the Bank of England plates pass into their possession. Cheer up, old fellow, cheer up. As Dr. Samuel Johnson once said, there's no problem the mind of man can set that the mind of man cannot solve. What's that, old fellow? I was just quoting Dr. Samuel Johnson. He said there is thank no... Thank you, Watson, thank you. Hmm? Leaving the front reception room, we come into the main hall, where Dr. Johnson was in the habit of passing through to have his meager meals in the dining room opposite, in company with his friend and biographer, James Boswell. We will now pass up the stairway, which remains in its natural wood finish, just as it was when the good doctor was here. The framed etching on the wall is believed to have been presented to Dr. Johnson by the distinguished painter, Sir Joshua Reynolds. I've been told here that that picture was given in by Mrs. Thrale, and it's definitely not a Reynolds. Is that important, my dear? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Uh, this way, ladies and gentlemen, please, this way. Move along, children, move along. The secretary's not on this floor. Patience, Hamid. I have a feeling My that... dear Colonel, with Sherlock Holmes out of the way, what could go wrong? And here we have the Garrett Library, in which Dr. Johnson wrote his famous dictionary, and in which you will see also many of the great man's books and other items of interest. Step forward, ladies and gentlemen, please, step forward. Standing in the corner is the secretary, which contains many of the original works by the literary genius. On this table, Dr. Johnson's cat, Hodge, used to sleep while his master worked. A strange thing about this cat, ladies and gentlemen, was its love of oysters. They do say that the dear doctor often went hungry to find the cat that delicacy. What a pity. Now we will visit the grave room, which is immediately below us, in which you will see the very bed in which Dr. Johnson died. What did he die of? Gout. Just gout. 
This way, ladies and gentlemen. Mind the steps, please. Your keys. Shelf up. The knife. Gentlemen, the Bank of England plates. Well, Mrs. Courtney, so we meet again. No, I shouldn't do that if I were you, Colonel Kavanagh. I must congratulate you, Mr. Holmes. You're far more clever than I thought. Thank you, Mrs. Courtney. Praise from you is indeed gratifying. I shall always cherish the memory of your flattering words. Memory? Oh, thank you. And now I have a most regrettable task to perform. Holmes! Coming, Holmes! Holmes, you all right? Perfectly, thank you, old fellow, but I think this gentleman on the floor requires some medical attention. We will see that he looks his best, you know, when he's hanged. Take him in charge. A brilliant antagonist. It's a pity her talents were so misdirected. Will you see that these plates are returned to the Bank of England, Inspector? I still don't understand how you solved it, Mr. Holmes. It's entirely due to Dr. Watson. He gave me the clue when he mentioned Dr. Samuel Johnson. Well, congratulations, Doctor. Oh, thank you, Inspector. I don't think I'll have done it entirely without Mr. Holmes's help, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh.